Every 60 seconds, a minute passes. Every 24 hours, a day passes. And every three months, a fantastic Yuri passes. When you have an anime that starts off with kidnapping your brother's freshly exed fiance amidst the breakup argument, refusing to elaborate, and flying off on a jet engine broomstick, you know you're looking at a giga chat. And NTR. This kind of premise, along with a plot structure similar to my favorite anime, was bound to catch my attention from the start. Yet, while my first impressions told me to prepare for a slowly, beautifully crafted journey of self discovery, I instead got beautifully crafted characters, 15 <laughs> stages of depression, and the most closure I've ever felt from an anime in a long time. But to tell a tale's end, we must first start from its origins gay abduction. Because remember, brothers. You want a happy love life, your final obstacle will always be your sister. Wait, no, not like that. When you hear people review or praise an anime, you often hear the analysis of certain aspects such as why the world building is good, how the characters are deep, why we relate to a pink cartoon blob more talented than most of us will ever be. Yet through all that I wanted to explain and blab on about, I realized that everything I liked about Tenten looped back to one big focus. Closure. Every character, every conflict, every plot point mentioned in the first few episodes did a perfect 360 professional athlete backflip to loop and end its own tale. And some later plot points that initially felt like random bullshit go, I discovered upon rewatch was actually foreshadowed or hinted near the beginning. So today, I'd like to go through each of these points one by one and fan bo- I- I mean, uh, analyze how well crafted all these characters and plot points are for a 12-episode anime. Anes is a character that began as Isekai Chisato. Through the toughness of being a rare case of a royal born without magic, she smiled and fought through it like it was nothing. She's the kind of person that would show up at the police station covered in blood holding the victim's decapitated head to report a murder and unironically say, Officer, I did not kill him! She looked at the misfortune of not being able to use magic and said, Bitch, I'll do it myself! Better! That is how freely Anis lived. That is the free lifestyle Euphelia looked at in Envy. Someone who never looked back and cursed her misfortunes, but instead always did what she could and wanted to with a goofy smile. It's not about what you weren't born with, it's about what you do after you were born. Such as destruction of property, kidnapping, sexual harassment. Anis is the strong one, the one who will lead Euphelia to find meaning in her life. The one whose knowledge and power could revolutionize all technology and traditions known in the kingdom. The one who lives more freely than anyone, bound by absolutely no one, is what the anime wants you to think. As the episodes go by, you start to realize that part of this Chisato personality is a farce. Yes, she is greatly bothered by the fact that she can't use magic. Enough to go to dangerous lengths for it, enough to feel like a failure to her parents. Her goofy, clumsy troll side? An attempt to put herself down so nobles will think Al as a more worthy candidate of the next ruler. And when she is forced to become the next queen, she accepts the responsibility as she feels it's her only worth as her parents' daughter. Remember what Chisato did when Fungi Man asked her to stop the greatest terrorist attack of all time? <laughs> <laughs> her cheery front comes collapsing day by day as she struggles to tell herself she's okay until the breaking point, where Euphelia offers herself as sacrifice for Anna to continue living freely, yet shackled by her own sense of worthlessness without the presence of a formal responsibility, she refuses and breaks down. You can only tell someone to get in the fucking lab so many times until they break down, am I right science majors? This breakdown is arguably the first time Anis has shown this true side of herself she's hidden away for so long. The weakness she hadn't dared show anyone. And it's her wife that finally manages to break her out of this shell and make her admit that no, she's not okay. No, she doesn't feel fit to be queen. No, she doesn't want to comply to four ugly bastards. She wants to angry birds them. The final episode gives a beautiful conclusion to Anis' character by showing that both sides of her were the true her. The cheery outspoken girl was as present as ever, but she's also much more open to sharing her insecurities and emotionally relying on her wife. As one should. Not that I would know. Just because she felt the shame of not being able to use magic doesn't mean her love for magic was any less true. And the most important truth of all, she accepted her role as a bottom. She like me! She like me for real! And from this, we draw a beautiful conclusion to Anis. The girl who was once free only on the surface was now truly free on the inside. 
Agnes is most certainly not the only character with such a conclusive ending, though. Euphelia, aka clearly not into humiliation kink, aka PTSD for only $5.99, aka this video is sponsored by Better Health. Euphelia is born as a gifted magic user with the responsibility to marry Al and become queen. If Al wasn't such a <laughs> After a traumatic breakup that would cause even a Shibuya fuckboy to break down like a bitch, Euphelia is essentially depraved of any of the responsibilities she once held. In a sense, she was freer than ever, but raised strictly as a noble who adheres to rules and responsibilities, she's lived her life doing nothing but following orders, as if a robot processing every command given. This dramatic change of lifestyle forces her into a journey of self-discovery. And motherfuck- I mean sisterfucker did she discover a lot. What would she do from now on? What could she do from now on? The free Anis plays a huge role in helping her find a purpose in life. We see various episodes go by as she continues to ponder her existence and gradually grow closer to Anis. By the seventh episode, her chat GPT AI develops enough for her to proactively self-generate a speech defending her wife, and soon, she finds her personal emotions conflicted by her responsibilities as a noble. The AI, they grow up so fast. After a lot of understandable denial and pushing on the back by based girl, Euphelia, going against everything she's been taught since she was born, puts her feelings above her responsibilities, freed from her self-inflicted chains. And so finally, by episode 11, she finds the real meaning to her life, to free Anis by becoming queen. This is, in so many senses, beautifully parallel to everything this show has built up to be. In the beginning, she was going to become queen out of political responsibility, and she later even says she's not cut out to be queen and it'd be too much for her. But in a very ironic sense, the meaning of her life she'd been pondering for so long was in front of her eyes the entire time. Anis. This time, she would not be becoming queen under somebody's order, but of her own free will. This time, she would not be acting under fake love for the sake of responsibility, but for true love under her own emotions. This time, she would not be shackling somebody's life, but freeing somebody's life. The very person that freed Euphelia herself at the very beginning. Through Anis, Euphelia found her true responsibilities. Through Anis, Euphelia found her true emotions. Through Anis, she found herself. In many ways. In a sense, Euphelia found her freedom through Anis's shackles. The very girl that was once ascending to be queen in shackles was now ascending to be queen as the key to someone else's shackles. A poetic end to a poetic tale. Alright, I know I bitch a lot about this gamma male of a human who looks like the first basic bitch guy in every otome game that no girl picks but even I have to admit. The conclusion to his character made me feel something. Al starts out as a typical inferiority complex villain who feels trapped by his role as a royal, envying his sister's free personality. In a way, very similar to Euphelia, but the rebellious kid. See, I told you opposites attract. You can pair top and bottom, but you can't pair top and bitch! You get the impression that Al is just this naive child who's crying over what he doesn't have at first, but you later realize it runs deeper and darker than that. The inferiority complex part wasn't a lie, but he didn't just hate himself, he hated everything. And himself. Like, a lot. <laughs> As someone who looked up to and loved his sister, he despised everything the kingdom had built itself up to be. The irreparable gap between the ugly bastard- I, I mean nobles- and commoners. The curse known as magic and all the stupid traditions around it. He hated how someone as brilliant, as caring, as talented as Anis would be shunned, deemed unworthy of the crown simply for the obsession this kingdom has with magic. He hated how he was given a role on a silver platter he knew Anis could feel much better than him. He hated how powerless he was, unable to change the things he hated, and most of all, he hated himself for existing because all his powerless existence has achieved is bring badmouthing to Anis. All his powerless existence has achieved is cause his dear sister pain. Acknowledging his lack of power, he sought to destroy the kingdom so he could rebuild it into one that throws its old traditions away. One that could look to the future instead of the past, and most importantly, one that would truly accept his dear sister the way she was. Uh, oh, I guess poverty's a problem too. 
Fuck off, poor people! Are you my sister? Are you genius enough to invent technology that can cause a revolution? Do you have the words incest engraved in your forehead? Yeah, that's what I thought! In a very ironic sense, we were at first led to believe he was looking at his sister in disgust, but nah, this man was the greatest siscon mankind has ever known. I'm sorry, did Kyosuke try to destroy a kingdom for his sister? Get you a man that looks at you the way Al looks at Anis. Okay, maybe not like that. Again, ironically, it's after he'd lost to Anis and got exiled that for the first time, his expression looked at peace. He no longer had to deal with the responsibilities and pressure of being royalty despite being powerless. The crown would next go to his well-deserved sister, and most of all, through all the clashes, he'd managed to vent out everything he'd been suffering alone with for so long and make up with his dear sister. So basically, I'm going to jail! In the end, the royal who was born with privilege was the happiest when left as a civilian with nothing. The brother who worried about his inferiority to his sister his entire life was at most ease when proven right and accepting it. The man who sought to wield overwhelming power to change the world was at most peace when he was left with none. Anyway, that's enough sad backstory, right? <clears throat> oh my god, he's the cute overprotective yandere boyfriend who wants to steal your heart so much he gouged it out. So adorable, tee -hee. One more thing I really found unique and loved about this anime is how magic is dealt with. In many fantasy and isekai anime, magic is just this thing that naturally exists without explanation. It's not a plot point, it's just a thing people can use. As if wielding a knife, smashing a hammer, or smashing a girl. In our story, Anna's not being able to use magic is a constant pressing matter that affects the motives of characters and flow of the story. It's not just a made-up reason for Anna's to love magic, you could quite literally call it the core of the entire story. Every plot point, every conflict, every thing pretty much has to do with the presence of magic. You start the anime where it's introduced as this thing Anis loves so much. Oh my god, it's like one of my fairy tales! It's like Barbie! Or Matoka Magica! <laughs> Magic is presented as this wonderfully positive thing, a dreamlike tool to be used. But again, as time goes on, you start to see the many perspectives it brings. Some adore to the point of dedicating their life to it, some saw it as a religion, some cursed its presence and influence, some were like, bro, it's not that deep, while single-handedly being the most OP magic user in the kingdom. I see you, straight A genius kid. The fact that magic, something we all take for granted in every RPG world, is used as an actual tool for storytelling, and not just a bro it exists okay thing, is simply very intriguing to me and makes me appreciate this otherwise I'd say fairly standard generic RPG world. And again, it's not a one-time issue. Anis has a... Uh, ah... Complicated, toxic, abusive ex-girlfriend that her brother despises but she's like, I can fix her relationship going on with magic. Yet through all of the political, depressing bullshit Anis has to put up with in the story, I even feel like both magic and Anis' relationship with magic was put to a proper closure. Magic begins as this fantastical tool that Anis yearns to use to bring a smile onto people's faces, and after 5 roller coasters, 2 breakups, 1 siscon, PTSD, and a kingdom of assholes, we somehow beautifully conclude everything with Anis using magic to bring upon a revolution and an infinite crowd of smiles. The very vision she initially dreamed of. No, it wasn't about the journey for her this time. It was about the fucking happy ending. Okay, maybe the journey mattered a bit. She got a wife and she got her personal maid a wife. Alright, there are many other small aspects I'd love to fan but uh, uh <clears throat> talk about, but isn't significant enough, slash I can't be asked to write a 500 word pretentious literature essay describing why a 40 year old man with vegetation makes me happy. So this is a speedrun corner of all the small things I wanted to mention. Ready? Yuri! Bro, they really foreshadowed everything. Like, holy gay ship, they mentioned the spirits early on. The totally not gay dads talking, hinting at the immortal decisions they couldn't make. I'm just not wanting the throne as comedy. Comedy at first. Make you fall in love? Make you fall in pants? Did you notice Anis using the Ooga Booga drug at the very beginning of the anime? I don't normally support animal abuse, but you 
fucking decapitate the shithead. Let's go. The planes at the end, the thing they designed for the lecture using the dragon's materials. Damn, that dragon outwisdom the Wright brothers and Confucius. Probably, probably. Grant mentioned the king liked touching grass so much he was gonna study touching grass for a living? Well, Livin isn't the happy man himself with a wife and vegetation. Yuri! And the fact that Anis' isekai was treated as the somewhat insignificant small detail at the beginning, only for it to be revealed to be the reason for her feelings of guilt and worthlessness, while still making sense looking back as a part of the story? What the f- Fuck, I came here for gay girls not existential isekai therapy session. But it's a gay therapy session, so it's okay. Yari! The kisses at the end! Years upon years upon years of anime has trained me to fucking give up on any sort of kiss or actual proper Yuri relationships in any anime. This anime casually walks with a 1 and a 2 and a 3? I have never felt so fucking this kind of closure, this skinly satisfying feeling with two drawings of fictional people's relationship. Doc, can I write that down, write that down, write that down? You still have a chance. And one more thing, one more thing. The OST is magical. I can't believe I don't hear anyone talk about it. It's so beautiful. Every song has this elegant, majestical vibe with classics such as I'll Kidnap You. Swear Anis isn't a criminal. And finally, the OP. My god, the OP is so good. Haratan is a fucking fun gremlin on stream. How does her voice turn like that? Hanatan is a god we don't deserve. I never abandoned you since the Romeo and Cinderella days. <laughs> so yes. Clearly, I love this anime. I don't think it's perfect. I have a few small problems here and there, like the final fight between Anis and Euphelia being a bit too short for my liking, and the final arc's problem being resolved a bit too fast in general. But to be honest, it's completely overshadowed by the goofy-ass smile I had at the very end. From characters to visuals to music, Everything was crafted amazingly, but to me, the biggest selling point was really the closure of the final episode. Nowadays, there are so many anime I love that just end abruptly and never get a season 2 and I never go read the source, so I just get left with an unfinished story I like. So having this story feel so conclusive in every aspect imaginable felt special to me. I know the light novel source continues on, and I would love to see a season 2 of how the entire magical revolution happened, but even if the story just ended at this point, I'd still be completely satisfied. Anyway, Season 2 and Tenten provided me the closure I'd sought in the story for so long, and it all looped from this very quote in the first episode. The story you are about to hear is the story of two young girls from a certain kingdom. The story of a princess who loved magic more than anyone else, but whom magic did not love in return. The story of a noble lady who was born with everything, but had nothing. The story of the revolution. This was truly a revolution. 